for sport. But I often say that there, there are three types of fight. There's the fight that we're interested in. Only those of us in boxing are interested in. There's the fight that people who are interested in sport generally take an interest in. And then there's that third category, which is a very specialist category where people are not necessarily even interested in sport follow the fight as well. And, and that definitely fell into that third category. It felt massive. And I always know from friends who text me saying good luck with the commentary or, or editors and producers who, who never text. But you know it's really big. It's really important when you get texts from people that you've not spoken to in a good while. And it was a great era for British boxing as well. In I think within the last four or five weeks before that fight, Joe Kalzaki had beaten Mikhail Kessler on a massive night indoors at the Millennium Stadium, as it was called at the time. And David Hay had beaten Jean-Marc Mormet. So you had these three figures, David Hay, Joe Kalzaki and Ricky Hatton, who really transcended sport. And they were bigger than, than just boxing. And I know that from my experience working not just on a sports network, but a news and sports network. So I have to battle for boxing's place on the network, not just against other sports, but against other stories. And it was much easier to do that in that era with those names that were so recognizable to everybody, to news editors as well as sports editors. And Hatton was a massive part of that. And, and I was just thinking in the last couple of days, you know, having been asked by you two guys to, to come on about, it, there's almost a poignancy about it. I mean, imagine that fight now when we can't have fans. It just wouldn't have been the event that we're all talking about. We remember it so fondly. Yes, it was, it was a good fight. It was an enthralling fight, but it was just quite some distance from being a classic. But what made it was, was the fans, the build-up, the, the differences in their personalities, their boxing styles. But the whole event was made by a great chunk of Britain just <laughs> almost emigrating to Las Vegas for a couple of weeks to, to build the fight. It's just an amazing noise. And it's one of those that just could not have happened without fans. It, it was absolutely extraordinary. And, and I know what you mean about indicators as to whether something is, is really that big or as to how big it actually is. Because I was thinking to myself, I didn't have Sky at the time. I couldn't, I couldn't get a dish. There was something going on with my landlord and I can't really remember what it was to be honest, but I was thinking, whose who's flat am I going to invite myself around to and insist that they get the pay-per-view? I'll even pay for it myself. They don't really have to watch it. I just need their living room for the night. And then I just got loads of offers, loads of offers, people just saying, yeah, I'm going to buy the fight. People who I previously thought had no real interest in boxing at all, to be honest. And that, that for me, just made me realise this is, this is really caught fire. Matt, you were right on the inside of it. When, when you're in the eye of the storm, it can be really hard to to know exactly how something is growing and snowballing outside of that, of that inner sanctum. Did you get the sense that this was taking on a life of its own, really? Yeah, definitely, without a doubt. I mean, Rick, Ricky Hatton had been a, a huge, you know, it had been a big name, huge name in Britain, British boxing, British sport, for a while before that, really. I mean, I remember the Costa Sue fight and there being something in the air that night, Costa Sue being a, a legend and all the rest of it. And, you know, when he beat Costa Sue, he went to another level. Then he went over to America. Then he put Carlos Myers, and then he went over to America. And, and he was building in America. And I think the, um, the Louis Castillo fight took his fame to another level. You know, Wayne Rooney carried out the belts. There was a lot of the footballers went over there for their holiday to watch the fight. And, you know, he wasn't just on the back pages then. He was on the front pages. So his profile definitely hit another level. And, of course, he got Castillo out of there. I think it was the fourth round, third or fourth round with the body shot. And, you know, afterwards, Max Kellerman sort of teed him up. Did he have anything to say to Floyd Mayweather? And, of course, Ricky being witty and funny, you know, said, yeah, you know, I think you've seen more excitement in those four rounds than you've seen in Floyd's whole career. And Floyd having the ego he has, you know, was like, oh, I'm coming out of retirement, make that fight. And um, so it was set up nicely. And then, of course, the build-up, as Mike said, you got two absolute polar opposites in terms of personalities the training camps you know billy graham completely different to roger mayweather how they see boxing how they went about preparation i mean it won i think they're 24 7 
won an Emmy Award. It was just, it was an unbelievable piece of television, of which I shamefully played a star in rolling, which I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. But anyway, I mean, being over there at the time, we'd, we'd been over there for a few weeks for the Castillo fight in Vegas, had a house four miles off the, the strip. Obviously, they had everything kept the same for the Mayweather one. But, I mean, definitely the press that came in, it just gripped the nation. And even though we were in Las Vegas, you, you were hearing bits, you were getting, you were seeing, you were getting bits, and it wasn't, Social media wasn't really around then like it is now. I think it was just starting to come, wasn't it? Facebook and different things. But no, it was uh, without a doubt when we were over there that fight week, there was just, I'd never been around anything quite like it. I mean, and, and as Mike rightly says, it, they were literally coming in by the plane loads. It was unbelievable. Like from the Tuesday, there was quite a lot of people come in. Wednesday, double, <laughs> triple that amount. And by Thursday, the place was just taken over. Like the MGM Grand was like being in Dean's Gate. It was just mental, wasn't it, Mike? Oh, it was. It was absolutely fantastic. And I remember earlier in the year, in January, he fought Juan Durango in in Vegas. It was at the Paris Hotel, and it was a much smaller affair. But I often say, you know, if if you could build a, a template. Uh, a blueprint for university students who are studying PR or promotion as to how to build a name in a foreign country, in a strange land. Ricky Hatton, from that point onwards, the way he engaged with the media on that first trip, I remember in the Las Vegas Review Journal, after he went home in January, they said, we were thinking of telling customs to stop him at the airport because we've so fallen in love with him. We wanted to stay here all the time because he brought a flavor to boxing that the Americans just had never witnessed before. This kind of the humor that he brought. I remember when, it, when the press conference uh, on the, you know, the final press conference during fight week started, Urango was already sat down and Hatton walked along the back, tapped him on the shoulder and then shook his hand. And it was as if, any kind of venom that Urango had was drained from him. You know, at that point in the week when he's, he's trying to start to hate Hatton, Hatton taps him on the shoulder and shakes his hand. I mean, it was very different during the Mayweather week, but it, it was really interesting watching that development. And then there came the, the Castillo fight that you talk about, Matt, and, and, and his, you know, his interview with Kellerman afterwards. And how it, it kind of all built from there. It, it was a long way from an overnight success. It was, it was really brilliantly done by, by Hatton and, and the people around him. But, but Ricky played the game, played the, the people's person, the people's champion. And, and that, that really connected with the United States. And what helped, of course, as well, was that everybody loved to hate Mayweather. So you, you had the perfect fight poster, you know, the, the, the good against the bad, the hero against the villain. Yeah, it was almost like a perfect storm of polar opposites. And you know, it, 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 even even the um, the fact that he'd signed that three fight deal after the Mayweather a win, he'd gone with Banner Promotions, which was Artie Palulu and Hobson, and you know they weren't big promoters, let's say. But when after the Castillo fight, then he done he signed with Golden Boy for the the Mayweather fight, and that, at, at that time Golden Boy were head and shoulders. They even though top rank, you could say over time had been the biggest one, but at that time, two thousand and ten. Golden Boy had really gone to another level with HBO. They had great relationship. With, I can't remember who was head of HBO Sports at the time, but they were kind of really running the show and they were doing these massive events. They were bringing in all the proper PR people and they, you know, they did these press, these press tours, like, you know, five cities in five days and they just smashed it out of the park. They really did. And, you know, HBO, the 24-7, they, I mean, they, they spent millions on those shows and it, it, it really really, really captured uh, everyone's imagination. Like you say, it was almost like a perfect storm. And I remember the, the press conference in London, Matt, was at the O2 Arena. It was in the theatre within the, the complex, but it was a massive turnout. And that was the first indication to anybody who wasn't already aware that, that this was going to be massive, the, the media turnout. But just the, the whole feeling of, of how big this was becoming at that time and this was in September for a fight that was in December so you had this ratcheting up almost day by day by day and I spoke to Richard Schaefer who was massive within Golden Boy at the time and he said by the time we get to December 
every soul breathing in the UK and in the USA will know this fight's happening. They might not buy it, but believe me, with what we do with these two fellas, they'll know it's happening. And it was it was magnificent promotion built on, as I was saying, Matt, what what Hatton himself had done on two previous visits to Vegas earlier in that that year. Yeah, and Mike, not, I'm just trying to. I'm actually, you know, it's coming back to me now. Even when we're talking, I remember they. I think they flew from London or Manchester, wherever. Flew to New York. They did the presser in New York. Then I think they flew to LA. Did the presser in LA. Maybe did Vegas as well. Then landed back in London. And then the day after London, it was Manchester. I mean, this is like in five days. You know, you literally do five cities, five days. And I remember Ricky Hatton at the Manchester press conference. Ricky's got a fantastic sense of humour. He is very funny, very witty. <laughs> <laughs> and if it had just been down to the slagging match, Ricky, Ricky would have won a unanimous decision and it would have been a shutout. He absolutely destroyed Floyd when it comes to the, the slagging and the banter. But, you know, obviously the fight ended up being different. But, you know, I, I was talking to Billy Graham at that London press conference and, and he'd been on these private jets flying all over the place, as you say, Matt. And, and Billy said to me um, that Floyd Mayweather had been really amenable, really convivial. You know, they sat at the back of this jet having a chat. And he said after one of these chats, he got up to get off the plane and, and they had a hug. And he said to me, he's tiny, he's tiny. He's absolutely tight. He's not a welterweight. He's not a welterweight. And, and I think that was that was um, in the thinking. I mean, you, you were in the camp, Matt, but it, it, what's really interesting, and I know we're, we're fascinated, Matt, by, by perceptions during fight week and how they can change. And I was working that week in fight week with Richie Woodall, and, and he arrived on the Monday. I got there on the Sunday to, to do some preview work, and he arrived on the Monday, and we were walking through the casino in the MGM Grand, and, and Ricky and a, a couple of others, you might have been there, Matt, came through, and, and Richie and Ricky had a big hug. And as we walked away, Ricky said, uh, Richie Woodall said to me, he's a tiny welterweight. And, and, and I laughed about that. So I, I, I had Billy Graham on the one hand saying that Mayweather was tiny, and I had Richie Woodall on the other hand saying that Hatton was tiny. So you had all these, all these different opinions being thrown up into the air during fight week. And that's, that's a fascinating part of, of, of stories like this. I mean, you know, Billy Graham and, and Richie Woodall are, are, are so educated and they have such a tutored eye, but this was the kind of fight where everyone had an opinion. Everyone had an opinion, whether they were schooled in the sport or not. I, rem I remember, and it's, it kind of touches a bit on what Andy said, as in like, when you're so close to something, Sometimes it's difficult to see, have an objective or a subjective view. And, and obviously, Ricky, we were good pals with, you know, it was only me, Ricky and Matthew at the time with Billy Graham. And I remember speaking to you afterwards and you said to me how you were amazed that some really good, experienced guys from the UK got totally swept on fight week with the hype and the patriotism. You know, and they went with Ricky and they picked Ricky and they paid for different things. And you said, I remember you saying to me, I never, I make my mind up when a fight is made, whether it's that eight weeks or 10 weeks, whatever, when it's, as soon as the fight is made and announced, I make my mind up because what happens fight week is all that sort of stuff can get, can change your mind. We're all human. We get persuaded. We get talking with the backstories and, you know, the late money and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I've always kept that with me as I've gone on. Even now, when, when a fight's made, I make up my mind what I think is going to happen. I don't wait till fight week because fight week you could change your mind five times a day. <laughs> because in, in, in the media center or wandering around the hotel, especially in Vegas where you bump into fight people every 10 meters or whatever, and, and you can listen to very learned opinions and, and you get swayed by them. But it, it was really interesting that week. I think it was, it was the, the best example that I, I use of, of how you can be swayed by others opinions and, and sometimes you know those opinions turn out to be much better than yours but there's um, I've got a copy of the Las Vegas Review Journal from the day of the fight I mean I've, I've got notes like six inches thick from, from this fight it's such a special event in my career and there were I think there were 31 boxing writers polled 24 went for Mayweather and seven went for Hatton and all seven of those are British and I know Ron Lewis, for a fact, still talks to this day about how he regrets making his call. He said he arrived in Las Vegas the previous weekend, absolutely convinced that Mayweather was going to win the fight. 
and in his preview in the Times, he wrote that Hatton was going to win by decision. He was one of those who'd been swayed. It's very easily done across a fight week like that. This kind of theory perception grew and grew and grew that Hatton was naturally the bigger man and that his work to the body with the vivid memory of what he did to Jose Luis Castillo in their minds, people were thinking that the body attack would break Mayweather down eventually. That, that was the general, the general basis of that opinion that was, that was growing day by day behind, behind, May, uh, behind Ricky Hatton. So but from a, from a distance, Andy, I'm just interested as to why, what, what was it about Hatton? Because we were so close in our different ways. What, what was it about Hatton that, that drew you, that made you, made you go to a mate's house at four o'clock in the morning? Because they got stunning pay-per-view figures for a fight that was four and five in the morning. I think what it was with him was, it, people have talked about this a lot, about the, the kind of boy next door, kid off the estate kind of quality that he had. And, and, and it was that. It, it's repeated so often, it sounds like a cliche, but in sport, relatability is a really important thing, isn't it? Because if you feel like you can relate to the person who's getting in the ring, none of us really can, if we're pure observers like me, who's never done anything like it. But if you feel like, if you meet them and you feel like you already know them, and we've probably all made that mistake earlier in our careers with, with, with certain people, then you know that that person has got something about them. And I think that's what it was with Hatton. And I kind of watched his career grow. I remember seeing a box on the same bill as Matt, actually, um, at the conference centre in Wembley a few years previously. A, a colleague of mine at TalkSport, who was a Mancunian, had, had said, you know, we should definitely go and, and watch this fight. And it only lasted a couple of rounds against Justin Rosal, but it was just the way he boxed. I think that was another thing that, that really drew people to him. And I think the press tour did play did play a big part because I've just got it written down here. Los Angeles, then Grand Rapids, which is Mayweather territory, then New York, then London, then Manchester. And he came across great in the press tour. He came across as what he is, as a man with some humour um, who was down to earth. And Mayweather came across as kind of the opposite, basically, because at that point, was he money Mayweather by then or was he still pretty boy? I can't yeah. remember. He, he just made that jump to money, Mayweather. He'd, he'd fought, and, and, and you know, Golden Boy was just starting to do these extravaganza events and uh, the 24 7. I think the only one before this was the De La Hoya Mayweather fight, and then this, then he retired, and then this was the fight that got him out of retirement after Ricky, you know, goaded him to Max Kellerman. So, it, um, yeah, it, it was just, it just had the perfect dynamics for what ended up being just an unbelievable, unbelievable event. Like you say, you know, the fight in the end, you know, Ricky giving his all, but, you know, he wasn't good enough. And, and, and that's no shame because Mayweather, I, mean, I remember that night being in the corner just thinking, because I remember, I know, I remember Mike was a big Mayweather fan and he was really big on Mayweather. And now looking back, I, I, I could see why Mike, you know, had it spot on, do you know what I mean? But because, Ricky was my pal, and even though you're trying to be not biased, it's impossible sometimes. And you know, but when I look back, he, he, he um, my, um, that night I remember thinking to myself, "Wow, he really is that good." Because let me tell you, Ricky Hatton was a lot better than a lot of people thought he was. You know, he was he was clever, he was crafty, he was a good. He weren't just a slugger. He wasn't just physically strong. He had great feet. He had great anticipation. He was smart. Do you know what I mean? He really was. And a lot of fighters that fought Ricky underestimated that in him. And I, having sparred so many rounds and being around him close, knew how good he was. And to see Mayweather dismantle him and beat him the way he did, I remember just thinking, wow, he really is that good. What, what... I think what Mayweather showed on the night, sorry, Andy, what Mayweather showed on the night as well, you know, you talk there about, Ricky, you know, being really clever, really smart, terrific reflexes. And on the flip side, what Mayweather was never really known for, Matt, was how hard he can be and how dirty he can be. And, and on that night, he proved that he can, he can do whatever he needs to do. If it gets filthy and dirty, then he can do that. And he'll go as far as Joe Cortez or whoever it might be will allow him to go. But you talk there, Matt, about me being so keen on, on Mayweather. You know, I'd watched him, like all of us, from afar for a long time and loved what he did. I first saw him from a broadcaster's point of view at the Olympic Games in, 
1996 in Atlanta when the American team had a, a team press conference and all of the boxers were lined up alongside each other. And, and Mayweather was towards the end and he was just leaning on his, on his hand with his elbow on the table, yawning virtually all the way through. And I was there with Steve Bunce and we, we looked in the American team guide and said, who's this, who's this little kid on the end? He looks like he's completely uninterested. And it, and it was Floyd Mayweather. And I, you know, I, I watched him a couple of times at the Olympic Games and, and, and loved his style there without ever pretending to forecast that he was going to go and do what he did but I had watched his professional career and was really impressed by him but earlier that year when he beat De La Hoya in in, in that year 2007 that's when I really started to understand how special he was because he hadn't quite become the superstar that fight and then the Hatton fight were what really began that transition of, of Floyd Mayweather turning from brilliant world champion into boxing superstar and he did it pretty much on the back of De La Hoya's popularity and Ricky Hatton's popularity by, by playing the heel, by happily being the man that everybody wanted to lose. And I watched him closely during the build-up when you could actually get reasonably close to Mayweather. I got a one-on-one -on -one for about 10 minutes with him in his gym. We went to the public workout that, that now is, is pretty much a cosmetic exercise for any big fight. But back then, he went through a proper training session and it was just fascinating to watch. It was my first time seeing the, the pad work that he does with, with Roger Mayweather. And there were a couple of journalists there who said, oh, what a waste of time that is. He's not going to use that in the ring. And I said, you know, that Sebastian Coe didn't only ever run 800 meters in training. There are all sorts of elements in training that, that build towards making, making the champion. And then to watch what he did on the night against a much bigger man. And this was something I said to, to Billy Graham at that press conference where he said to me that, you know, I've hugged Mayweather on the Jets and, and, and he's tiny. And I said, but he's been a welterweight for two years. He's acclimatized. He fought Zab Judah, Carlos Baldemir, and, and he, was, he was acclimatized in that heavier poundage. And in fact, he fought De La Hoya at light middle um, and, and, you know, took some shots from, from De La Hoya, but to me ran out a comfortable winner. I was really surprised when that turned into a split decision. But watching him around that week, um, and look, I could bang on and on and on about the experiences, but I do remember at the, the weigh-in on the Friday of the De La Hoya fight, which is where it was the first time I had seen this event where the weigh-in's an event. They opened up a third of the MGM Grand Garden Arena, 7,000 people turned up, and probably all but five of them were Hispanic, going mad for De La Hoya. And on the stage, Mayweather stepped off the scales and he just very slightly miscued in putting his foot into a pair of gym shorts, a pair of baggy gym shorts. And I just thought, here's, here's probably the most fluent, loose, agile boxer that I know. And he's actually missed his footing. Only, only just slightly clipped the top of the shorts as he was putting them back on. And I thought, having gone for Mayweather heavily all week, he was, he was really showing the signs of how big this was, how popular De La Hoya was. And he'd suddenly realized this was so uh, much bigger than anything. And I thought this was nerves. And I thought, you know, I've, I've picked the wrong man here. Um, and yet he turns up, whatever it was, 36 hours later and produced the most brilliant performance. And so when he looked equally nervous on the scales against Ricky Hatton, I took that as a bad sign for Hatton because... To me, the more nervous Mayweather looked, he used that and then he got his head around the situation and by fight time was using that nervous tension.